Hi everyone, thank you for coming along. I am Tony Foley, the IB coordinator here at St Peter's, which means that I run um, or coordinate the IB programme. And tonight I'm going to first of all go through a little bit about what that programme looks like. Um, it is a alternative curriculum to NCEA. All students at St Peter's do year 11 NCEA and then they get to choose whether they want to continue on with that style of teaching and learning and assessment and do level two and level three, or would they, would they like to opt into a different style of teaching and learning, the IB curriculum, which is a two-year course with one qualification at the end of year 13, the IB diploma. Tonight I'll go through a little bit about what does that look like, how is it assessed, what do, um, what do a typical student's timetable, what would, what would that look like. Um, we'll have a talk a about what sort of teaching and learning happens and what sort of student the IB um, would be more suited towards. And at the end, um, there's going to be a chance to ask questions that would be answered by some of our current IB students. Uh, so there will be a chance for you to ask anything that you'd like. So as we're going along, if you think of any questions, at the end we'll open that up. Out in the foyer, we have um, a little bit of a summary pack that sort of outlines a bit of what I'm saying, but I'll also send out this presentation um, to anyone who has RSVP'd, or if you didn't RSVP, that's all right. There's a clipboard just out in the foyer that you can write your email in, and I will send that out to you as well, so you don't feel the need to have to write notes or any of those things, because there is a lot of information. The IB mission statement um, is, as what is up on the board there, it's about the main reason the IB was instigated or decided that this sort of a curriculum would be needed was because it, it, the people who wrote it felt that there wasn't a curriculum that currently was helping students to become what would be needed to change the world, okay, to change what we were seeing in the world. Overall, the IB aims to create students who are um, caring, who are inquisitive, who are willing to work together and collaborate, to view the world through different perspectives and not be limited to their own perspective. And the ultimate goal was to create a world that was more peaceful and cohesive because in 1968, when this curriculum started, it was sort of seen that that wasn't what was happening, that we were seeing more conflict in the world. At the moment, we have around 156 countries who offer this curriculum in over 5,000 schools. So it is really widespread um, and offered across the board. All major universities recognise the IB curriculum and the IB diploma as a qualification. When you go onto university websites, you'll be able to see um, the prerequisite information for NCEA, and then there'll be different information or university entrance for IB, and also in New Zealand uni universities, you often see, for example, the Cambridge curriculum as a comparison. The IB diploma is a two-year course. It takes the full two years, and at the end of the two years, that's when you sit the formal assessments, and then you are awarded the IB diploma which is the qualification that you were awarded. Okay, this is distinctly different than NCEA. NCEA, each year level, works in isolation. You get a year 11, level one NCEA certificate. Then you can, at year 12, work towards the level two certificate. And then at year 13, you work towards the level three certificate, which is required for university entrance. For the IB diploma, to get university entrance, you would get that at the end of the two years when you are awarded the diploma. There is a build-up of learning over those two years. The focus is on learning how to learn, not necessarily how to memorise, for example. It's really important students practise skills on how to inquire, how to deduce, how to, de how to explore different ideas, and how to come to knowledge in situations that they've never faced before, for example. They're taught how to problem solve, how to learn through trial, making mistakes and then learning from those mistakes. That's a real emphasis. All students must study six subjects. That is a key requirement. And on top of that, they also need to learn the core elements, which is indicated in the middle of this um, diagram. Theory of knowledge. They do one extended essay, which is about 4,000 words long, and they need to meet the requirements of the creativity, activity, and service program, which I'll talk about shortly. One of the big emphasis um, or central parts of the IB is looking at the student as a learner, 
and developing specific attributes that we describe as the learner profile. The IB aims through each of its different subjects to provide opportunities for students to learn by being risk takers, by having to communicate with one another. They need to show that they are able to be reflective. They need to show that they're able to be open-minded, for example, and they're given lots of different opportunities to use these and develop these attributes. The, approaching, the approaches that are used in, within the teaching profession are very specific within the IB. We need to provide opportunities as teachers for the students to learn through inquiry, and that is when students are having to ask questions and then they're not told the answer, but rather they have to struggle a little bit to figure out that answer. In the foyer, what you saw are some examples of projects that students have done where they came up with the question and they were guided through how they might go about answering those questions, but they weren't told the answers to those questions. And that is difficult. It's a real challenge for some students. A lot of students want to be told the answers and be told what it is that they should be memorising, for example. That's a really safe way to learn. But the IB works in a very different way. And classes sometimes require students to have to push through the unknown before they get to the known. It's real, the other central pillar to the pedagogy behind or the principle behind um, the IB program is that students need to use particular approaches to learning or learning how to learn is what we like to, um, a phrase that we use within the IB world. They need to learn how to think, they need to be, learn how to communicate, they need to learn how to reflect, they need to learn self-management, and that is one of the things that students take some time to have to work through, and some students might say that's one of the bigger challenges of IB, learning that self-management, learning how to prioritise and plan their time, learning that although they might want to spend a lot more time on a particular task, that in the grand scheme of their life, they need to delegate and prioritise. Okay, these are skills for life. As adults, many people in the room here can understand that you're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis within your jobs. You have deadlines, and sometimes that means you need to make sacrifices in other areas. Okay, this is a program that forces students to have to learn those skills, and that can be a challenge. Students learn six different subjects. Those six subjects, they need to decide which three of the subjects would they learn, like to learn at higher level, which means in greater depth and three subjects they choose to learn at standard level, which means in not as much depth. What that sort of translates to is about 240 hours of teaching time for their higher level subjects, and about 150 hours of teaching time for their standard level subjects. Both of those levels are still assessed in the same way. The assessments are slightly different, but the weighting of those subjects, a standard level and a higher level subject, is the same. They also do a critical thinking course called the Theory of Knowledge that I'll talk about briefly in a moment. They do one extended essay. Those were examples of different extended essay questions students have done in the past or through the foyer. And they reflect on all of the things they are doing outside of the classroom where they also are learning things about themselves and about the world around them. All students have to do English literature as a course. They also need to learn a second language. This is really important within the IB philosophy, not because they feel like students are going to use that language necessarily, but because it forces students to view the world through the lens of a different culture in a way that you can only do when you are exploring their, their language and comparing it to your own languages and your own culture. Okay, that is central to the IB philosophy and it is a really important part of what makes the IB the IB. Students often struggle with that, and I have a lot of students who ask me, can I do IB and not do another language? And the answer is no, because then you're not doing IB. IB is wanting you to be open-minded, and one of the ways we help you to do that is by forcing you to view the world through a different cultural lens. That's the purpose of the language. They then get to, sorry, and they also do a mathematics, and there's two different mathematical courses. One is more about um, more heavily focused or weighted towards the statistics, but it do, still covers all different areas of maths. And the other course is more heavily weighted towards calculus, but it still covers all areas of maths. It's not as pure as looking at a calculus course or a statistics course. They then get to choose three other subjects, and we're going to have a look at 
what that might look like in real terms for some students. And there's, a, there's a wide range of subjects to choose from. I'm not going to go through all of this. They're grouped based on the category of subject. Um, and roughly, the general idea is that students choose one subject from each group. But there is some flexibility here. For example, some students could choose no group six art subject, instead choosing to do two sciences. Or perhaps they want to do two humanities, maybe economics and business management, or history and geography. Or, alternative to that, some students want to do two art subjects. They want to do theatre and music, or dance and music, or dance and visual arts. And they have the flexibility and ability to do that because there is a subject called ESS, or Environmental Systems and Societies, that fits across both the humanities and the science branch, um, and therefore allowing them to have two subjects from arts as an example. It's also possible for students to do three languages, but I've never had a student ask me to do that. But if you want to, you are welcome. So here are some examples of three, or sorry, four different students' timetables that are current students at our school. Group one is English, so all students do English, and you can see these students, some of them have chosen to do it at standard level, some of them at higher level. Group two is the language, and you can see some of the different languages students have chosen. The ab initio course for language is brand, students brand new to that subject. They've never had exposure to that language before, and about 70% of our students will be in this category. You don't have to have learned a language before to do IB. You don't have to choose it in year 11 to do IB. You can choose ab initio, which is a course designed for brand, students brand new to a language. If you have got exposure to a language, then you would be in the B course. So Japanese B are for students who have learnt Japanese before and so is French B, for example. Group three are our humanities. Group four are our sciences. You can see student C, instead of a science, they've chosen theater. And they've been able to do this because they've also chosen ESS in group three, which covers both group three and group four. Um, in their group six arts subject, they've chosen film studies. So that student happens to be our current head boy, and he is very passionate about his arts. You can see student D, they've chosen two sciences. So instead of doing an art subject, they've chosen to do bio. And within their science area, they've chosen chemistry. So there is flexibility. And there is even more flexibility outside of these examples. Under certain conditions, we can apply for something called a non-regular diploma. And that's something that I can talk to you about if you're interested after the presentation. So around the outside, you can see those different categories. We've got the arts, mathematics, individuals and societies. Those are those groupings of subjects. And the idea is that students, like with the languages and the requirement to do a language, they're forced to view the world from many different perspectives so that you don't have a narrow focus, so that you can consider different world issues with many different hats on, so that you can have more of an ability to consider and weigh up other possible ideas apart from your own and what your default might be from your little comfort zone. It is a challenge sometimes to have to spread yourself across these different areas. In addition to those subjects that they're doing, there's the core, um, the DP core. I'm going to explain a little bit more. The Theory of Knowledge course has changed recently, but the focus is still on getting students to critically evaluate their knowledge. It's not about what we know. It's not a content-based course. It's a course where students are asked to consider when you're provided knowledge in science, how can you know um, the extent to which interpretation is going to influence what you are being presented as knowledge? How is that knowledge being justified? How can we be certain that that knowledge is accurate? What, to what extent is perspective relevant when I'm considering that piece of knowledge that's been presented to me? So that course is about teaching students to be critical when they are looking at that myriad of information that's coming at them from all different directions on a daily basis, which is even more relevant now than it was in 1968 when this course was first designed. The Theory of Knowledge course is not assessed in the same way as all of the other subjects. There are two assessments. One of them is an exhibition that's done at the end of the first year, and the second assessment is an essay, which is done um, in class time in the second year. The Theory of Knowledge course, along with the extended essay, these need to be passed in order to get your diploma. Ideally, the IB would like these 
two parts of the diploma not to be assessed at all because the main emphasis is meant to be on learning through a process. There are some bonus points as an incentive for students to apply themselves more in these areas, but those points are called bonus points because we want the emphasis to be about what you are taking away from what you are doing rather than I just want this grade. Creativity, Activity and Service, or the CAS program, is about the extracurricular pursuits that are really prioritised in the IB. The IB wants students to recognise and to acknowledge that learning about the world around them does not just happen from a textbook. It doesn't just happen in a classroom. Everything you're doing, every interaction you have when you're out on the sports field, when you're playing or learning an instrument, when you're taking part in the school production, all of those are opportunities to learn about yourself and the world around you. This part is about getting students to acknowledge that they need to have a well-rounded, balanced life in order to be a high-functioning member of society and to be a quality human being. It's about rec uh, recognising the importance of that balance in enhancing our well-being. This part of the course is assessed through reflections. Students are taught how to reflect on what they're doing and what they're, they're learning from that. It isn't marked in any way. It is about keeping track of what you're doing and reflecting on what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, setting yourself goals and then reflecting, am I meeting my goals? Why? Why not? Is my goal a valid goal in the first place? Should I change my goals? The extended essay is an opportunity for students to essentially do a mini thesis for all of, all of you who have gone through tertiary education. It's a chance for students to learn how to do what you are asked to do at university all the time. They have to come up with a research question in a subject area of their choice, and then they are given a mentor to support them through how do I go about answering that question. Now this is really different from what they're doing in classes when your teacher teaches you how to go and do and answer the question. In the extended essay, their mentor guides them. The mentor helps them to consider what are some options here that I could try to try and answer my question. It is a process that the students often find quite challenging to start with, but it's also one of the things that many students, once they're finished IB, say that they are most proud of. It is that situation they're put in where they need to try many different things, and some of those things don't work out before they get to what actually does work. They are given a lot of support, but it is something that students need to work through, and they do outside of class. They do this 4,000 word project over six months. So it's not something that's done overnight. They're given quite a bit of support and it's broken down into much smaller tasks. Most of the examples that are around the room out in the foyer, those are examples of EEs that have been done, extended essays, in the last two years. Either the research question or the science fair boards. Often what we do is with our science students who have chosen to do a science EE, they can then choose to um, submit those in the Waikato Science Fair, and nine out of 10 of them then get prizes or awards because they are at a level of science that is above any of their peers in most other curriculums. IB is assessed very differently than NCEA. NCEA, you build up, or you do many assessments over time. IB, you do typically, for most subjects, one internal assessment over the two years that's usually worth about 20% of your grade and the rest of your grade is from the exams at the end of the second year. Every other topic test or the end of the first year practice exams we do are for the purpose of learning from your mistakes. Do a test, recognise what have I learnt so far, where are the gaps, do some more learning. And this is where that cyclic learning how to fail well, learning how to recognise when you don't do well on a test, that doesn't mean you aren't good. It doesn't mean that's the, the measurement of how well you can do. It's a measurement of where are you in your learning journey right now. And it helps you to recognise what should I be looking at to help me move forward. So teaching students to be constantly reflective and to work on their learning journey and get better over time, make connections. Most subjects have two or three exam papers that have different styles of questions in them. For example, in science, there is paper one, which is all multiple choice questions, assessing their recall of information or applying information to new situations. Paper two are short answer questions, so it might be one sentence, 
sometimes one word, and then a couple of paragraph answers. And paper three in the sciences is about assessing their skills, their ability to apply what they've learnt from their practical investigations in an exam situation. This is one of the areas, again, that is quite different in IB, where in NCEA you do get a chance to show different um, styles of answering exams, for example, in the internals. The exams, for the most part, are written responses and they're long responses, in the sciences at least. I'm a science teacher, so that's the, the main area I could speak to. In standard level and higher level, like I said before, of equal value, each subject you end up with a grade out of seven. So you get a percentage mark overall or achievement for your exams and your internal put together, and that's translated into a grade. In higher level physics, to get a seven, you only need 57%. Well, that changes year on year, but about that. In higher level biology, you need 83%. So the percentages aren't a really good way to tell if you're doing well. It depends on which subject you're in, and that is relative to how challenging those papers are. The maximum score that you can achieve in IB is 45 points. To get that, you would need a seven in all six of your subjects to get 42 points, and then you would also need to have done well enough in both your extended essay and TOK to get the three possible bonus points. To put this in perspective, 0.01% of students sitting the International Baccalaureate, okay, that's about 200,000 students a year, 0.01% of students get a perfect score of 45. The top 10% of students will get 40 points or more. Okay, those are very, very high scores and they are arguably not what students should be expecting. A very good score in IB is 33 points and that's the average that we get here at, at St. Peter's. The reason that I would say that it is a very good score, that it's automatic entry into our most competitive courses here in New Zealand, which is engineering and health sciences. If you get 33, you get automatic entry. Okay, that shows you how highly regarded some of these courses are to universities when you're considering careers like engineering or health science as an example. To get university entrance, you need 24 points, which equates to around four a grade of four out of seven in each of your subjects, and it assumes no bonus points. So you've passed the extended essay and TOK, and you've achieved a grade four, which is roughly 50%. You get about 50% in your assessments. Okay, and this is because it is not measuring memorization of knowledge. It's measuring how you apply that knowledge to novel situations. The exams are not basic recall. There's a certain number of questions which are, but then there is another number of questions, a whole heap of those questions, which are applying some of the skills that you've used, applying, um, looking in the sciences, for example, to brand new data from an experiment you've never heard of, and considering, based on what you've learnt in this topic, how would you interpret this data? Okay, so there is a very different focus on what we are measuring in those assessments. Our top grade at St. Peter's to date, this is our 13th cohort or 13th group of IB students, is 44 points. We've had, I think it's three students achieve this so far, but that is incredible. If you can relate that to 0.01% of students getting 45, I'm not sure what the percentage is to get 44, but it's not much bigger than that, maybe 1%. I'm making that number up. I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's about that. Okay, about 10% of students get 40 or more points. So to finish up my part of the presentation, something that students often ask me is, how do I know if IB is right for me? It's so different to NCA, how can I know? The sorts of students who are going to do well in IB or are going to thrive in this curriculum are students who are self-motivated and driven. If you are not self-motivated and driven, that is a skill you can learn and you will learn by default in the process. But if you're already self-motivated and driven, you're going to find it as a curriculum that you enjoy. Students who are organised, that demonstrate initiative so they don't wait until they're failing or struggling before, and for someone else to notice, they go and they ask, look, I need some help. I would like some help in how to do this particular thing. I'd like you to give me some guidance on how to manage my time because I'm, I'm having some trouble with that, for example. Okay, demonstrating initiative 
is something that students who are able to do that, they will really enjoy this. Students who have average academic ability can do well in IB. It is designed for the average student, ideally. Students who enjoy a challenge, because there will be challenges. I've talked to you about a couple of examples, like the extended essay, where you might find that it is a challenge. Students who enjoy working towards significant goals, because there are a number of opportunities where that's what you're doing, for example, with the extended essay. And students who, above all else, are willing to show perseverance and resilience. Remember, the assessment style is all about learning how to fail well doing assessments, doing tests, and potentially not getting a great result the first time, but learning from those mistakes and being willing to try again. Because the end measurement is not until the end of those two years. Okay, the topic tests are a step in the learning. They're not the end of the learning, like they are, with, for example, if you're doing a particular assessment in NCEA. So that is the end of the, the information. I do realize it's a lot of information. So like I said, I will send this presentation out to everyone. Um, next, I'd like to invite up one of our alumni, Morgan Blind. Morgan Blind is, oh, there she is. She's going to come up and just describe to you a little bit about what she has taken away since graduating from St. Peter's in um, 2018 and what she has taken particularly from the IB program. All right, hi everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Mrs. Foley for inviting me to speak tonight. It's so lovely to be back here and able to share how IB has helped me since graduating. So I'll begin by sharing a little bit about myself. As Ms. Foley said, my name is Morgan Blind. I'm originally from Auckland, but my family and I moved to Cambridge in 2017. Um, I started at St. Peter's and it was just in time to also start the IB. So I came for year 12 and then finished off with year 13. During high school, my other major commitment alongside IB was being a member of the rowing team. So I started rowing at Westlake Girls High School in Auckland and then continued my final two seasons um, off at St. Peter's. In 2018, I graduated from St. Peter's with an IB score of 40. Upon leaving St. Peter's, I was fortunate enough to gain admission to Harvard University in the United States. So in 2019, I moved to Boston and started studying towards my Bachelor of Arts with a major in psychology and a minor in global health. I'm also a member of the Harvard women's rowing team. However, as you can see, I'm obviously not in Boston anymore. And with the COVID pandemic, um, Harvard required all students to leave campus and they moved all tuition online. So I've been home for the past 14 months and a lot of that time was spent on Zoom in my bedroom. Um, there's always a silver lining though, and since coming home, I've been a part-time rowing coach at St. Peter's, a research assistant at the University of Auckland, and I founded my own Instagram organization to advocate for female athlete health. On Monday, I am returning back to the States and I'll be there for three months in San Francisco before going to Boston and returning to campus for the new school year. The US is an incredible place and I'm forever grateful for the opportunities it has given and continues to give me. But I do have plans on coming back to New Zealand for postgraduate study. So hopefully now you feel like you know me a little more. I wanna share three things that IB taught me and that have helped me in life beyond high school. So the first lesson is that the world is a big place. As you'll be aware, this is the world, and this is New Zealand. It's pretty small, right? And I think that we can um, forget that a lot of the time. So before I went to the States, I considered New Zealand to be a pretty diverse place. You know, pretty multicultural, a little bit of history here and there. Overall, quite a diverse country to live in. It wasn't until I lived in the US when I realized how much the world I, I knew little about. And I found myself constantly drawing back to and relying on a lot of my IB education to navigate the various different religions, races, genders, and socioeconomic statuses that a larger population brings. I was thankful that through IB, I was able to continue French and reach a level where I could talk to the Harvard students who were from France. I was thankful that IB psychology taught me how some mental disorders are highly stigmatized in Asian cultures, so I was able to better understand why some of my peers refused to use the mental health services. 
I was thankful that my IB English teacher chose to study Broken April, an Albanian novel about a group of people who engage in blood feuds to take revenge on those who have wronged them. In fact, just last week, I had a final exam where I had to explain the psychology behind the, this revenge-seeking tactic and why they originated in the first place. Directly and indirectly, IB has helped me to be a better Harvard student and citizen of the world. The second lesson is that balance is key. I'm not gonna lie, balancing rowing, friends, family, and academics was tough at school. But as I have since found out, it doesn't get any easier once you leave. In fact, leaving school comes with a whole host of other commitments and responsibilities that you're expected to juggle on top of what you were already doing. IB gives you the opportunity to practice time management and figure out how you can be successful in all aspects of your life. It gives you the chance to figure out what works for you and what doesn't, so that when you get into the real world, you're ready to hit the ground running. Yes, the academics of IB are important, but the program also places a huge emphasis on being a well-rounded individual, one that can be successful both in and out of the classroom. My final lesson is that effort matters more than result. At the end of the IB diploma, you will be given a score out of 45, and many students, myself included, will hyperfixate on doing everything you possibly can to get the best score you can. The, real the reality is though, since leaving St. Peter's, I have never once been asked what my IB score was, because a number out of 45 says far less about your character than the effort you showed and the lessons you learned along the way. US tennis star Arthur Ashe once said, success is a journey, not a destination. The doing is often more important than the outcome. And I think that sums up IB perfectly. Thank you.